My name is David Lori Vanderbeek. I am the Constitution Party's candidate for governor of the state of Nevada in 2014. I'm going to give you the punchline first in this video, and then I'll set all of my reasons forth for the uh, title. Now, this video is a message to all Americans, including those of you who are serving in the military and law enforcement. America is losing all the freedoms that define it as America. The American dream will come to an end unless we draw the line. Every one of you is going to have to make a decision. Obama is moving to become a dictator. In order to do that, Americans must be disarmed. Our government is preparing legislation to have firearms confiscated, beginning with semi-automatic rifles and military-grade handguns. I'm asking you as Americans to become public and vocal. I'm asking you to publicly state with me that if anyone in the, any level of government uses physical force to remove your firearms, that you will defend yourselves. From these uh, people who are trying to overthrow our form of government and turn America into a police state modeled after Nazi Germany or communist Russia. In this video, I'm going to lay out the historical facts that show where the, our country is headed. Specifically, I'm going to compare the United States to the rise and fall of Nazi Germany so you can make the undeniable comparisons yourself. Why am I standing up against Obama? Because someone needs to, and someone needs to be brave enough to say something about what's about to happen. The stench of cowardice is settling like a fog over America. I'm fully aware that taking this decision puts me at great risk. I have no dealings with organized crime or the federal government. I have a lot going for me personally, and therefore everything to lose. I'm 37 years old, a working professional, uh, get, or working on my Ph.D., my wife and I are passionately in love. She's a beautiful woman. We have been blessed with five wonderful children. She and I have had the talk uh, so that she and our children will be taken care of if anything happens to me. We have a close extended family who support one another. But the bottom line is, is that I'm a student of history and, and we are students of history. So we can see that our nation will collapse if we continue on our current course. Our children will not enjoy a bright future unless we take a stand. I've set my life in order so that I'm ready to suffer whatever is necessary so that our children and our grandchildren will be free. You, the American people, know that I'm telling you the truth. You're buying weapons at a record pace because you subconsciously know that you must prepare for the possibility of the second civil war in America. You also know that your government is building an army a domestic army through the DHS to go to war against the American people. I want you to know that it's not too late for the Constitution to be restored as the supreme law of our nation. The truth is that Obama, like any other tyrant in history, can make all the oppressive laws he wants, but you still have a choice of whether or not to obey. If you are a police officer, you still have a choice as a human being of whether or not you will enforce an unconstitutional law. You have a mind, a heart, instincts, and a soul. You can and must choose to disobey unconstitutional orders. Because if you police go along with gun confiscation orders from this government, you're going to have to kill me, and I won't make it easy. If that starts, there will be an insurrection. Americans aren't going to cower in their houses waiting for you to come. They're going to come find you first because they know history. Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote about what it was like to be in communist Russia when people were being arrested and put in gulags and concentration camps and executed. Quote, and how we burned in the camps later thinking, what would things have been like if every security operative when he went out at night to make an arrest, had been uncertain whether he would return alive and had to say goodbye to his family, or if during periods of mass arrest, as for example in Leningrad, when they arrested a quarter of the entire city, people had not simply sat there in their lairs, paling it with terror at every bang of the downstairs door and at every step on the staircase, but had understood that they had nothing left to lose and had boldly set up in the downstairs hall an ambush of half a dozen people with axes, hammers, pokers, or whatever else was at hand. The organs would very quickly have suffered a shortage of officers and transport, and notwithstanding all of 
Stalin's thirst, the cursed machine would have ground to a halt. If, if, we didn't love freedom enough, and even more, we had no awareness of the real situation. We purely and simply deserved everything that happened afterward. Post quote. During the last election, I was a candidate for U.S. Senate for the Constitution Party here in Nevada, and I said then in the Reno Gazette that the only defense spending which, with which we should concern ourselves is arming ourselves in self-defense against our own government, which is almost in tyrannical freefall. That is how I spoke, and I gained nearly 49,000 votes. Now, I want to be candid. It's not going to take 49,000 armed Americans in Nevada to stop gun confiscation in this state. 300, a few hundred committed people for the Constitution will be enough to stop. I'll be irrelevant. I'm not advocating violence. I'm just describing, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do as a political leader. I'm describing the past, the present, and the future. You can put me in jail, but people will come for me. You can kill me, but then people will come for you. Personally, now I've prepared for whatever comes. I'm ready. Recently, we were told as Americans that one gunman killed 27 people in Newtown, Connecticut. There is no proof whatsoever of that government propaganda. There is no video footage. There are no photos. So I did what a leader should do. I issued a public statement listing many of the contradictions of the government's story and how that shooting is being used as the 9-11 against our Second Amendment. This video is called Did Obama Order Sandy Hook Shooting to Get Your Guns? Nevada Governor 2014, David Lori Vanderbeek. I'm not going to comment at length on that tragedy here, except to say that if the official story were true, all the lives could have been saved by having one armed guard at the school. If you go to YouTube and search the words Ob Obama Sandy Hook, you'll see that all the top search re results on the first page are Obama speaking, except my video. I gather from that that as of this moment, I'm the only major political leader in the United States willing to even ask real questions about the Sandy Hook shooting. So if you care about truth, if you care about the First and Second Amendments, you will search and promote that video. Now, our Department of Homeland Security was modeled after the East Germany Stasi secret police and the Communist Russia KGB. A couple articles you can look up. One's called, Former Russian Premier Ex-KGB Head to Work for Homeland Security. That was written by Chris, uh, Charlotte Iserby. Another you can look up about Marcus Wolf. In 2004, Al Martin of almartinraw.com reported that the DHS had hired Marcus Wolf, a former East German spy chief. Are these stories true? Probably. I don't personally know. But what I do know is that our DHS is becoming like the Stasi and the KGB known in history. I'm going to list all of my reasons why, and it's because of this transformation of our DHS and our government that you must prepare to fight them. Because if you're not willing to defend yourselves, I will show you from history that you will become slaves of a dictator, whether it's this president or some other. If the government lays siege against your home, you have a right to defend yourselves. You must respond with an absolute commitment. Decide and declare now that you will. Draw a line in the sand for the Second Amendment. Because once the Second Amendment is gone, the First Amendment is next. Now, I want to say a word to all the police officers on the police powers that you would have to abuse to confiscate guns. Question. Where do your police powers come from? Our Declaration of Independence states, Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So, as a police officer, your powers to arrest come from the consent of the people. How? Well, for the answer, we need to study the originators of our law. Thomas Hobbes is one of those, and he wrote the Leviathan. He explains that by natural law, every human being is born with the right of self-defense. I think we can all agree on that. 
In chapter 14, Hobbes says that the right of nature is the liberty each man hath to use his own power as he will himself for the preservation of his own nature. That includes police powers. I have police powers over myself. Unless what? Unless I enter into a contract with the government, thereby transferring the right of policing myself to the government. Employees. Now he goes on and he says, The mutual transferring of right is that which all men call contract. The contract that becomes law, and the law restrains me from exercising my right as long as I agree to the contract. The contract of which I speak is the U.S. Constitution. Now, if you police decide to violate the Constitution by confiscating guns in violation of the Second Amendment, which is so clear, then you have broken the contract and I'm no longer re required to recognize your police powers over me because those police powers are limited by what the contract protects. The problem, well, and this is the thing, is that you wear a uniform, you wear a badge, and you wear a flag, and you wear a gun. Those are all symbols of the contract. If you violate the contract, no one is required to recognize your police powers any longer. But there is a problem which I want to point out and that as you as police and the Americans in general, the public, are too stupid and ignorant to know their own rights and too cowardly to enforce them. As Governor of Nevada, I will propose the Second Amendment Preservation Act, which you can read at the Tenth Amendment Center.com, not because we need it, but to reconfirm our commitment to this original contractual provision in the Constitution between us, you as police officers, and everyone else. So, that uh, Second Amendment, it, all it says is that any rules or regulations that violate or infringe on our right to bear arms and be a militia of citizens are in violation of the Constitution. As governor of Nevada, I simply won't enforce them. I'll protect the people's right to bear arms. Now, I'm going to give you a list of historical facts about Nazi Germany and how it became a police state. First, I want to give you one, one story in tribute to all of you who are serving in our governments, our military, and our law enforcement, and that includes uh, Department of Homeland Security and the TSA. Before I share that story, I want to be clear with you. I'm asking you to decide and declare now publicly that you will disobey Obama's gun confiscation orders. Decide now and speak out. I will show you that if enough people had done that in Nazi Germany, it would have prevented World War II. Question. Did anyone in Nazi Germany ever defy Hitler? Yes. Erwin Rommel, uh, this is one of his biographies, it's called The Triumphant Fox. I'm going to share with you part of it. This is page 125. Rommel took great pride in the treatment given by his soldiers to enemy prisoners. He had very strong views on the subject of morality in war and proper military conduct. Africa Corps troopers were not normally permitted even to deny water to their captors much less beat or shoot them. Rommel's first friction with Hitler occurred over his over this point. This friction, which increased as the war went against Germany and Hitler became more and more vicious, escalated until Rommel came to despise the leader he once idolized. One prime example of Hitler's hatred and inhumanity towards enemy prisoners is the Fuhrer Order dated October 18, 1942. It read in part, from now on, all enemies on so-called commando missions in Europe or Af Africa challenged by German troops, even if they are to all appearances soldiers in uniform or demolition troops, whether armed or unarmed, in flight or in battle, are to be slaughtered to the last man. Even if these individuals, when found, should apparently be prepared to give themselves up, no pardon is to be granted to them on principle. I will hold responsible under military law for failing to carry out this order all commanders and officers who either have neglected their duty of instructing the troops about this order or acted against this order where it is to be executed. Signed, Adolf Hitler. The men of Panzer Group Africa never, un 
never read this order. Rommel and Colonel Westfall burned it on the spot. This was a man who had spent 30 years in the German army, army, who accepted the principle of unquestioning obedience, and who demanded that his own fellow men, his own men, follow his orders without question or comment. Burning an order that he was obligated by Nazi military law to pass on. This incident shows how deep was Rommel's devotion to the proper code of military conduct. He would not abandon it, even if everyone else did. It is also clear that he was beginning to think about the political situation and was beginning to see Hitler for what he was. This process, however, was far from complete in 1941, and the correct conclusions had not yet been drawn. Now here's a picture. There you see Rommel and Hitler shaking hands. It says in the caption, Rommel being congratulated by Adolf Hitler on his 1941 victories in the desert. Rommel's relationship with Hitler soured in 1942, and by 1944 he was actively plotting the Fuhrer's overthrow. Okay. So there you have a historical example of a real man, a real adult, a real patriot. Even though he was serving in the military, he was not a Nazi. He was a good German man, and he stood up for the correct code of police and military conduct. So I hope that you'll follow General the Desert Fox, Erwin Rommel's code of conduct, and his example in history, and you will disobey Obama's gun confiscation orders because they're coming, and you've got to decide now. Now, this is a book called In the Garden of Beasts by Eric Larson. It's a nonfiction, number one bestseller. Go out, buy it, read it. It's based on the life of U.S. Ambassador William T. Dodd, who served in Nazi Germany from 1933 to 1937, and he watched the rise of Hitler. So this is in 1933. You go to page 19. <clears throat> it, said, it says here, There existed at the, this time a widespread perception that Hitler's government could not possibly endure. People didn't take it seriously because they thought it was too irrational. It was just nonsense. And so when you see nonsense and irrationality coming out of the Obama administration, the general public doesn't take it seriously. At that time, just like in our day, people say, well, our generals will never follow those kinds of orders. They'll stand up against Hitler. or They'll stand up against Obama. But in the case of Nazi Germany, they never did. The generals instead brokered deals with Hitler. Hitler frequently publicly pledged himself to peace and to disarm Germany. It's interesting that um, they were saying that disarmament was in the name of peace. Uh, but this type of disarmament leads to mass murder. Also, another corollary is that the global bankers were at work in, in, in America and in Nazi Germany, just as they are in our day. It says here, when they appointed Dodd as ambassador, what Roosevelt, President Roosevelt and Secretary Hull considered the most pressing German problem was the $1.2 billion that Germany owed to American creditors, a debt that Hitler's regime seemed increasingly unwilling to pay. So they didn't give a damn about the uh, Jews or all the people that were being brutally treated by the Nazis, they wanted to make sure the bankers and corporate elite got paid. Okay? So, moving on to page 33. Um, when the reports of the violence got to America from Nazi Germany, everybody believed that they were exaggerated that no modern state could behave in such a manner. In other words, you're saying, well, there could be no concentration camps in America today. Obama would never do such a thing. Well, they said the same thing back in Nazi Germany, and you see how that worked out. Moving on to page 47. This is interesting because today... As in that day, well, in that day, the Nazis used the fears of terrorism to suspend civil liberties. Doesn't that sound familiar? Yeah, but instead of Al-Qaeda, it was the Bolsheviks. Um, 
one of the things that happened is that Goring's men and Hitler's associates burned uh, Germany's Reichstag. Now, they didn't burn it down. It still could have functioned, and that's one of the things that Dodd and his family noted, is that the Reichstag is the equivalent of our Congress. And so what Goring's men did, if I'm saying his name wrong, sue me, Goring, who was the head of the Luftwaffe, their men, those men burned it. It still could have functioned as a Congress. It could have been rebuilt, but they chose not to do that because... It consolidated emergency powers in the chancellor, which was Hitler. But they blamed the fire on communists, and they had a trial, and one of them was condemned to death. But others spoke out, and um, it was evident, even in Germany at the time, that the official story was a lie. Today, all bad events seem to be blamed on Al-Qaeda. And so when you read of terrorist attacks, these are staged by our own government the same way the Nazis staged the Reichstag fire. They're all fake, like the Sandy Hook shooting. The Sandy Hook shooting is the Reichstag fire for our Second Amendment. Now this is interesting. Joseph Goebbels was the Nazi head and the friend of Hitler. He was the head of uh, the Ministry of Propaganda, or so to speak. Uh, he would give them all the stories. He would tell the news. He, he controlled the news and the media. So the government takes over your media. Sound familiar? Uh, and tells them what to report and what not to report. This is what, this was Goebbels' opinion of his own people. He said, Berlin was, he wrote, a stone desert filled with sin and corruption and inhabited by a populace born to the grave with a smile. Now, I'm going to link a speech. That's what he thought of his own people. And I'm going to give you a link to a speech by Goebbels in which he is working the people up into a lust for war. Obviously, he doesn't care about his own people. He thinks they're good for the grave. He thinks they're sinful and corrupt. So if he really believed that about his people, he wouldn't care if they died in war. All right. Now, the next concept I want to bring to your attention, which is coming to America, and that is coordination. Now, in Germany, they called it Gleichschaltung, and it meant coordination to bring citizens, government ministries, universities, and cultural and social institutions in line with the Nazi beliefs and attitudes. So, we're talking Hollywood, we're talking the news, we're talking the schools, the universities, we're talking all the government agencies. They're all being politicized. Okay. Um, now, coordination, is it's interesting because it occurred with astonishing speed, even in sectors of life not directly related or targeted by specific laws, as Germans willingly placed themselves under the, way, the sway of Nazi rule. A phenomenon that became known as Selbstgleichschaltung, or self-coordination. Change came to Germany so quickly that across a wide front of German citizens uh, who left the country for business or travel returned to find everything around them altered, as if they were characters in a horror movie, who come back to find the people who are once their friends, clients, patients, and customers have become different in different uh, ways hard to discern. So... Uh, they could, they would be quite shaken, and it was interesting. And they would even put the Nazi swastika on candies. So that's coordination. Now, as things progressed, the people were arrested if they criticized the government. That's coming to America. Nazi Ger Germany became a tattletale society. Citizens would denounce one another. It is estimated of these accusations from one citizen to another, that 37% arose not from heartfelt political belief, but from private conflicts, with the trigger often breathtakingly trivial. In October 1933, for example, the clerk at a grocery store turned in a cranky customer who had stubbornly insisted on receiving three fennigs in change. The clerk accused her of failure to pay taxes. German denounce, Germans denounced one another with such gusto 
that senior Nazi officials urged the populace to be more discriminating as to what circumstances might justify a report to the police. Hitler himself acknowledged in a remark to his Minister of Justice, we are living in an era in a in a sea of denunciations and human meanness. So Hitler even thought his people were mean spirited. Okay? Again, another example of, of a leader not thinking much of his own people. You see, Hitler wasn't the problem. It wasn't just Hitler. Any more than Obama is the problem. We are the problem. Every one of us. The DHS, the TSA, and the police, they're just ordinary people. You're just ordinary people. Just as the secret police or the Gestapo, the Nazis, were just ordinary people. In private life, Hitler was prosaic and dull. He was described as extremely gentle. You see, he wasn't the one out there doing the beatings and the torturing. But other people, they would got those orders and they sure went ahead and followed them. This is on page 117. Speaking of the Gestapo, its agents or specialists were not the sociopaths of pop popular depiction. Uh, Robert Galately found most of them were neither crazed, demented, nor superhuman, but terribly ordinary. Now, he goes on, the Gestapo, the Gestapo enhanced its dark image by keeping its operations and its sources of information secret. Out of the blue, people received postcards requesting that they appear for questioning. These were uniquely terrifying, despite their prosaic form. Such summonses could not be discarded or ignored. They put citizens in the position of having to turn themselves in at the most terrifying of buildings to respond to charges of offenses about which they likely had no inkling with the potential often imagined, but in many cases quite real, that by day's end they would find themselves in a concentration camp under protective custody. Now, they call that protective custody, and that's what the National Defense Authorization Act does in our country. What the Nazis called protective custody, we've called uh, indefinite detention. So, now, initially, there was conflict between government agencies. The Gestapo under Rudolf Diels opposed the violence by the SA or stormtroopers at times, and they even released, uh, Rudolf would release their prisoners. But eventually, Diels was forced out and replaced by Himmler, who was very violent. Um, and he was uh, originally a chicken farmer, just as a side note. Uh, but Diehl's downfall was that he bought into the notion that government violence and terror were important tools. On page 118, he said, The value of the SA, the stormtroopers, and the SS Gestapo, seen from my point of view, Inspector General, responsible for the suppression of subversive tendencies and activities, lies in the fact that they spread terror. The, that is... A wholesome thing. So in Deal's view, violence and terror were valuable tools for the preservation of political power. He bought into that. He drank the Kool-Aid. Eventually, darkness overtook the whole uh, government in Germany, not just Hitler. Deal's uh, feared for his life. He told stories about how everyone... Um, Let's see here, it says on page 119, everyone in the Nazi hierarchy distrusted everyone else. How Goring and Goebbels loathed each other and spied on each other. How both spied on Deals and how Deals and his men spied on them in return. So there began to appear in a vast and complicated network of espionage, terror, sadism, and hate from which no one, official or private, could escape. Not even deals. All right. Now, page 150. Speaking of Ambassador Dodd, he said, initially, I had no delusions about Hitler, 
when I was appointed to my post in Berlin. But I had at least hoped to find some decent people around Hitler. I am horrified to discover that the whole gang is, gang is nothing but a horde of criminals and cowards. See, Obama isn't just a pawn, and no dictator is. They are a piece of a machinery, and that machinery gets out of control. I'm sure that there are elite people in our government and in corporations and in the banks that think they can control Obama. Uh, the, the elites in Nazi Germany thought the same thing of Hitler. They thought they could control him. Um, Franz von Papen, who was the vice chancellor, he was the protege of President Hindenburg. See, Hindenburg appointed Hitler as chancellor. And many people in Germany saw that Hitler was a problem, but they chose the path of cowardice. Now, this is what Papen said. He said, well, Papen and his fellow uh, associates, you know, the elites, imagine they could control Hitler. He said, I have Hindenburg's confidence. Within two months, we will have pushed Hitler so far into a corner that he will squeak. It was possibly the greatest miscalculation of the 20th century. And as historian John Wheeler Bennett put it, not until they had riveted the fetters upon their own wrists did they realize who indeed was captive and who was captor. So dictatorships are unstable. And dictatorships believe their own fairy tales. Um, Ambassador Dodd, had to publicly confront Vice Chancellor Papen on why we as Americans entered World War I. And Papen was, was so overcome with the fanciful thinking that occurs when people are drunk with power. Um, if you go to one ninety two, well, the story is on page one eighty eight where they have this public disagreement uh, as this reporter Schultz is asking questions. And uh, even though Dodd himself was a pretty mellow guy, he stood up because he was a history professor and corrected the chancellor uh, in public. And it says here that Messersmith, who was one of our other officials there, he observed that even smart, well-traveled Germans will still sit and calmly tell you the most extraordinary fairy tales. So there was a collective stupidity in Germany among their own elite. I mean, they come to believe in their own power as if it's legitimate, as if this state or this thing can continue on. And you see that in the spending of our government, for example. They really think that their fairy tale power can carry on. Um, but this, you would think one of the things that you might conclude is that, that Poppin would have hated Dodd after he was publicly called out, but actually the opposite happened. This is page 192. Uh, instead of embittered estrangement between Dodd and Poppin, there grew in, uh, a warm and lasting association. From that day on, Sigrid Schultz observed, Poppin himself cultivated the friendship with Ambassador Dodd with the great, greatest assiduity or persistence. Poppin's behavior towards Schultz also improved. He seemed to have decided, she wrote, that it was better to display his Sunday manners toward me. This, she found, was typical of a certain kind of German. Whenever they come up against someone who will not stand for their arrogance, they climb down from their perch and behave, she wrote. They respect character when they meet it. And if more people had shown firmness to Hitler's handymen, Poppin and his acolytes in everyday contacts, as well as in big affairs of state, the Nazi growth could have been slowed up. So they realized that even back then. You know, the problem is 
the longer you let this police state grow in America, the worse it's going to become. The TSA and police will become more perverted because perverts will seek the jobs in those agencies where their perversions are protected. This is on page 251. The Nazis realized the same things. This is, again, this is the head of the Gestapo, Rudolf Diels, before uh, he was forced out because he was not harsh enough. Listen to this. If you're not harsh enough or ruthless enough in a police state, somebody more ruthless will force you out. Um, this is what he had to say in 1933 about the violence. And remember, this is the same guy um, who a year before, this is in 1934, okay? In 1933, just one year prior, um, he had been the head of the Gestapo. But at this point, he has had to flee Germany for his life. And in reflection, this is what he said. The infliction of physical punishment is not every man's job. And naturally, we were only too glad to recruit men who were prepared to show no squeamishness at their task. Unfortunately, we knew nothing about the Freudian side of the business, and it was only after a number of instances of unnecessary flogging and meaningless cruelty that I tumbled to the fact that my organization had been attracting all the sadists in Germany and Austria without my knowledge for some time past. It had also been attracting unconscious sadists, i.e. men who did not know themselves that they had sadist leanings until they took part in a flogging. For it seems... Oh, and finally it had been actually creating sadists. It seems that corporal chastisement ultimately arouses sadistic leanings in apparently normal men and women. Freud might explain it. So... As you allow the TSA and the DHS to become more brutal in the airports, and, and, and I'm going to share a couple stories of that, they're going to become worse, and the people who would normally be in prison for, for crimes of violence will actually get jobs in those agencies. So here's a good uh, example of that. This is a headline you can search. Women suing state troopers over roadside cavity searches. I'll share the link. Deals was right. The more we allow police to be perverts as a duty, the more perverts will pursue jobs as police officers and be hired. So you can see in that video where the police officer, it's a female police officer, reaches her hands into the anus and then into the vagina in the pants of the of these two women uh, with the same glove and one of them actually got sick and they're suing them for that I personally if that was my wife I'm not sure what I would do um, I can imagine a few things I'm not sure if I'll be able to control myself if I see that happen so I'm trying to be civil about this I don't want to become a cold-blooded killer of police officers. I really don't want to do that. I, that's why I'm speaking out because it's accessing these kinds of stories are accessing a dark part of, of my personality and uh, they're causing me to speak out and I'm speaking out for peace because I want to prevent violence. I don't want to have a civil war in America but I want you to know if police are determined to treat women with roadside cavity searches, um, I will uh, gather like-minded individuals. I will go out by myself if I have to, and I will do what needs to be done to bring a stop to it, whatever is necessary. Now, I want you to contrast that story with this story. Female trooper who pulled over speeding cop fears for her life. The, so you have a police officer who pulls over another police officer who is breaking the law. The cop she pulled over was allegedly a serial speeder. She caught him going over at 120 miles per hour. And his only excuse for driving so recklessly uh, was that he was late for his second job. In other words, all the cops in that area 
decided to support the serial speeder and were persecuting this female trooper who was trying to enforce the law. All the cops around her had become scumbags. Because what happens in Nazi Germany and is happening in our country, if there is a good person in the government or a good cop, then all the bad ones are forcing them out, like this woman. It's a culture of corruption that we face in law enforcement. And these kinds of criminals, once they get these government jobs, they are above the laws that they enforce on us. But there are still good cops like this woman, and you need to get this story, and you need to support her. Now, I interjected those things. Let's go back to Nazi Germany and the Garden of Beasts. In June 7, on June 17, 1934, von Papen agreed to speak out against Hitler. So that's on page 284. This is what he said. The government is well aware of the selfishness, the lack of principle, the insincerity, the unchivalrous behavior, the arrogance which is on the increase under the guise of the German Revolution. If the government hoped to establish an intimate and friendly relationship with the people, he warned, then their intelligence must not be underestimated, their trust must be reciprocated, and there must be no continual attempt to browbeat them. The German people, he said, would follow Hitler with absolute loyalty, provided they are allowed to have a share in the making and carrying out of decisions. Provided every word of criticism is not immediately interpreted as malicious, and provided that despairing patriots are not branded as traitors. The audience reacted as if its members had been waiting a very long time to hear such remarks. As Poppin concluded his speech, the crowd leapt to its feet. The thunder of applause, Poppin noted, drowned out the furious protests of the uniformed Nazis in the crowd. Historian John Wheeler Bennett, at the time a Berlin resident, wrote, quote, it's difficult, it is difficult to describe the joy with which it was received in Germany. It was as if a load had suddenly been lifted from the German soul. The sense of relief could almost be felt in the air. Poppin had put into words what thousands upon thousands of his countrymen had locked up in their hearts for fear of the, un, of the awful penalties of speech. So, Poppin gave the speech. He was close to Hindenburg. They could have turned things around. The people supported the message, but it was too late. Hitler, Goring, Himmler and Goebbels decided then was the time to move. They claimed in, the, in an official news story that there was a group of terrorists in the government posing as Germans who had planned a coup. So on June 30th of the same month, using the Gestapo, they launched Operation Hummingbird. They used the story to arrest and execute their political opposition, including the head of the stormtroopers, Rom. The SA was put on leave. An estimated 500 people were executed that night and 15,000 arrested. Poppin and his family were luck lucky to escape with their lives. You see, the DHS and the TSA are our corollary to Nazi Germany's stormtroopers. Eventually, if America becomes a dictatorship, the DHS and TSA will be purged, including executions of any remaining internal patriots. So don't think that you can work in DHS and TSA and quietly be a good guy on the inside. They will identify you and you will be put on a hit list. The outside nations accepted the official story of Hitler. But as they studied the facts, they learned differently. This is on page 334. This is from Britain's Sir Eric Phipps. He came the closest to understanding the true message of the Rom Purge, the light night of the long knives. The killings demonstrated 
in what should have been in unignorable terms how far Hitler was willing to go to preserve power. Yet outsiders chose to misinterpret the violence as merely an internal settling of scores, a type of gangland bloodbath redolent of Al Capone's St. Valentine's Day Massacre, as historian Ian Kershaw put it. They still thought that in the business of diplomacy, they could deal with Hitler as a responsible statement, statesman. They still thought they could deal with Obama, Hillary Clinton, Valerie Jarrett, the Janet Napolitano as responsible statesmen. The next few years would provide a bitter lesson that the Hitler, that the Obama, that the Clinton, that the Jarrett, that the Napolitano conducting foreign affairs was the same one who had behaved with such savage and cynical brutality at home on 30 June 1934. Rudolf Diels in his memoir acknowledged that it, at, the, at first he also missed the point. I had no idea that this lightning hour that this hour of lightning was the announcement announcing a thunderstorm, the violence of which would tear down the rotten dams of the European systems and would put the entire world into flames, because this was indeed the meaning of June 30th, 1934. Now, uh, how did the public respond? This is going to spin your head around. The controlled press, not surprisingly, praised Hitler for his decisive behavior, and among the pop public, his popularity soared. Terrorism leads to soaring approval ratings. That's why governments stage terrorist attacks against themselves, because the leaders get a bump in their approval ratings when they come out and appear to be strong against it. So weary had the Germans become of the stormtroopers of the TSA and the DHS intrusions in their lives that the purge seemed like a godsend. An intelligence report from the exiled Social Democrats found that many Germans were extolling Hitler for his ruthless determination and that many in the working class have also become ensla enslaved to the uncritical deification of Obama. Hitler. Okay. So the people worship them because here's what's going to happen. Obama is going to use you, the TSA and the DHS and the police, uh, because he wants you to be bad so that eventually he can do, he knows this story, so that eventually he can demonize you, purge you, kill you, clean you out, and appear as a hero once again, um, thwarting a, a possible coup against the government. Okay, so does it remind you when it talks about un uncritical deification of Hitler, of Obama as well, that people treated Hitler like Messiah as they also do with Obama? Now, what happened to von Papen, the man who gave that speech against them? He wasn't executed because he was close to the president, but he was forced to resign, and he was sent to Austria as ambassador. Uh, don't think of von Papen as a victim, though. He was also an authoritarian ruler, but he just wasn't as ruthless as Hitler. That's the progression of tyranny, survival of the most evil. Um, now, Ambassador Dodd, I want to say a few words in tribute to him. He, he was prosaic. He was kind of dull. He was a professor of history at the University of Chicago. He wasn't rich. He wasn't elite. And for that he was very much disliked by most people in the U.S. Foreign Service who eventually forced him out. He would have continued on until 1938 if he hadn't been replaced. Uh, but in the end, he was absolutely right about Hitler. Uh, these are tributes to, to him. Dodd was years ahead of the State Department in his grasp of the political as well as the moral implications of Hitlerism and paid the penalty of such understanding by being virtually removed from office for having the decency and the courage alone among ambassadors to decline to attend the annual Nuremberg celebration, which was a glorification of Hitler. Mr. Smith applauded Dodd's clarity of vision. Quote, I often think that there were very few men who realized what was happening in Ger Germany more thoroughly than he did, and certainly... There were very few men who realized the implications for the rest of Europe and for us and for the whole world of what was happening in the country more than he did. The highest praise came from Thomas Wolfe. 
he said, Ambassador Dodd had helped conjure in him a renewed pride and faith in America and a belief that somehow our great future still remains. The Dodd's house in, in Berlin had been a free and fearless harbor for people of all opinions and people who live and walk in terror had been able to draw their breath with there without fear and speak their minds. This I know to be true. And further, the dry, plain, homely unconcern with which the ambassador observes all the pomp and glitter and decorations and the tramp and marching men would do your heart good to see. And that's what you see, a lot of pomp and circumstance in this government and a lot of the celebrations and things like that. But we can see the implications of what the Obama administration has for the rest of the world. And that's why we got to shut it down. So <clears throat> those are my notes on In the Garden of Beasts, this nonfiction bestseller, number one bestseller. Please get it and read it. In the interest of time, I'm just going to provide an overview of information from three other books. I have here Ellie Weissel's book, Night. Victor Frankel's Man's Search for Meaning. And Jim Marr's The Rise of the Fourth Reich. And what I'm going to do from these books is if you will read these books, you will understand everything I'm about to tell you. I've created a list, and it is what is or what was the Nazi process of mass murder, the 20 steps, okay? Um, and I will show you where we are at on these 20 steps. Number one, they started by attacking the Jews in the media. In other words, they use the media to demonize uh, good people. And we can see this in our media already. We've, we've achieved that step because we demonize. You can see the demonization of constitutionalists, gun owners, veterans, preppers, um, anybody who wants to speak out of the, against the government and support the original government uh, under the Constitution is demonized. Uh, they were are, are taught in DHS that people who support the communists, uh, the the Constitution are terrorists. So patriotism is becoming synonymous with terrorism. Second thing is that they they passed, step two is they passed legislation restricting the rights in the name of terrorism. And we've had that already. We have the Par Patriot Act, okay? Um, step three is restricting people from certain jobs. In other words, that's fascism. And that's when the corporate world and the government merge so that they control who gets hired and who doesn't. And you can see that today in the revolving door and how you can't break into certain industries because they've taken over the banking industry and they've taken over sectors of the government. So you are restricted from many jobs in the government. Number four is establishing a national police force to enforce new laws. And we have that. I've talked to several times about the DHS and the TSA. The Nazis used the SA or stormtroopers. So we've, we've passed step four. Step five, propaganda of terrorism to suspend freedom. So um, the propaganda in, in their day was the communist propaganda. And we have it in our day, but who, it's not the communists that we talk about. It's Al-Qaeda, right? <clears throat> Anything that uh, you can imagine, Al-Qaeda is going to get you. So we better suspend and lose more freedoms and give up our privacy and so on and so forth. So we've passed um, step five. Step six, government indoctrina indoctrination through the media. So, for example, this happens where they use the race card, for example. Um, the Nazis did that, you know, if, if you were pro-Jewish and you were uh, helping them, then you were against Germany. Today, it's if you're against the president, then you're a racist. So anything you disagree with the president on, Obama, because he's part black, uh, you must be a racist. And so if you don't turn in your guns, then you must be a racist. Okay, so we passed step six. Step seven, destroying uh, them economically because people couldn't get jobs 
Uh, Jews couldn't get jobs. They didn't have livelihoods. I mean, they were destroyed economically, they, professionally. Um, and we can see ourselves being destroyed economically because our government is giving bailouts to corporations who then move their companies overseas and they enter into trade agreements where uh, those corporations can take advantage of slave labor, labor in places like China and uh, Latin America or Asia and uh, they don't have to answer for any of that but you and I suffer the, the loss of that. So bailouts, also derivatives, the banksters are destroying us economically. That has happened. That has happened. So we've passed step se uh, seven. Uh, step eight is random beatings and arrests. TSA and NDA police violence. You can see the uptick in violence and sexual assault by law enforcement or government agencies. So you're seeing in the randomness of it. Sometimes they do it, sometimes they don't. Okay, so that's step eight, and we are past that. And that's what was happening in Nazi Germany. Sometimes they would back off. Sometimes they would really push. But they really hurt people. And you can see that now. I mean, why I pointed out that video of, of that state trooper in Texas going right into the pants of that woman. Step nine is disarmament of the citizens. Disarming you. So you are here. That's where you're at. Step nine. So are you going to be disarmed or not? This is the process. I'm going to tell you what comes after disarmament historically. So after you're disarmed, uh, then they have full control of freedom of speech because if, if you don't say what they want to say, you're on the step 10 and they arrest you and uh, you disappear. Step 11 is once they have uh, full control of the military, the Nazis, what they did is they would move people out of their homes into government neighborhoods, okay? So they would close off sections of the city. And that would leave the homes empty, which was nice for the Nazis because then they would confiscate all the property. <clears throat> That's step 12, confiscation of all your wealth. Step 13 is they then uh, put you into the... Uh, Government ghetto. So step 12 is moving you out of your home. Step 13 is com uh, st step 12 is confiscating your property. Step 13 is moving you into the government uh, ghetto. That's what the Nazis did. So there was an incremental process is what I'm trying to get through to you. It wasn't instantaneous. These steps took years to accomplish. Step 14, after once you were in a ghetto for a, a long enough period, then they would transport you in cattle cars to the permanent uh, working camps, concentration camps uh, that had the factories on them for the military industrial complex of Nazi Germany. <clears throat> That's step 14. They transport you to the camps. Step 15 is they actually separated males from females and they separated the families. Step 16 uh, is that they would feed poisonous food to the prisoners that would debilitate them. Like they would add sodium fluoride directly into the food, which is a sedative. Uh, it sedates the brain. That's why you're not supposed to eat toothpaste, because if you eat toothpaste, you can die if you get too much, because it'll go after your brain stem. Um, they still have those warnings on uh, toothpaste because of the fluoride in them. You're not supposed to ingest it. And it was the Nazis and the uh, communists that discovered that it was useful that way. So they put it in the food to sedate the prisoners. And that's why they never uh, rebelled. Now, 17 is uh, forced labor and starvation. So if they do give you food, it's poisonous. If they don't, then you don't have food. You don't have strength and you're forced to labor. And so uh, you're pretty worn down. Uh, step 18 is uh, that they're going to feed you to ovens uh, when you die. And you are actually going to carry your own dead into those ovens and the mass executions. Step 19, which uh, is kind of uh, the same time, is that the Jews policed themselves in those camps. They didn't have nearly enough guards. Like Solzhenitsyn said, there's not enough people... Uh, in the government to police all the citizens and throw them in camps. So they have to re to recruit the citizens themselves, and the Jews became the most brutal um, 
overseers over their own people in the camps. Uh, that's something that Eli, uh, Eli Weissel uh, talks about. And Viktor Frankl, you know, they talk about that at length, that uh, the worst guards, prisoner guards, were the Jews themselves to each other. And then step 20 is that they took children, adults, men, women, and the Nazis were very scientific. And so they did uh, eugenics and all sorts of experimentation. They did sterilization programs um, on their own population. If you were disabled, they would sterilize you. Uh, they're mentally retarded. But then those would expand to, you know, uh, sterilizing the Jews. And so you had all this scientific knowledge that came out of that tyranny. And one of the things that Jim Mars talks about in the um, Rise of the Fourth Reich is Operation Paperclip, how after uh, the World War II, Russia and the United States, us, uh, had secret fights. The governments had secret fights over the Nazi scientists, and they pulled them. And so it was a secret operation called Operation Paperclip by which our CIA got uh, Nazi scientists, murderers and killers and psychopaths and brought them here and their research. Um, some of that was used by Alfred Kinsey in his uh, study in human sexuality, specifically the information that they couldn't obtain legally, which involved uh, pedophilia and uh, sexually abusing children and a lot of the sexual violence, those kinds of pieces. They, he could lift that research from uh, the Nazi researchers. Um, other couple of things I just want to point out. So those are the 20, the, the 20 steps and we're about halfway. Okay. So you, you know, the, the, um, American bankers provided financing for the rise of both Hitler and Lenin. And, uh, that's why they wanted to send ambassadors to them to get them to pay back. American bankers have never feared communism or fascism because they controlled them through uh, international finance. And British bankers are also that way, too. The question is, where does this all stop? Well, it stops wherever you start to fight back. Now, there's an article in the Warrior Times that I'll link to. It says, what happens when governments disarm their citizens? So it looks at historical examples in the 20th century of governments disarming their people, taking away their firearms. 1911, Turkey disarmed its citizens, and between 1915 and 1970, they murdered 1.5 million Armenians. 1929, Russia disarmed its citizens, and between 1929 and 1953, they murdered 20 million Russians. It's probably more, actually. 1935, China disarmed its citizens, and between 1948 and 1952, they murdered 20 million Chinese. So it's probably more like 60 million Chinese. 1938, Germany disarmed its citizens, and between 1939 and 1945, they murdered 16 million Jews. I think it's more like 6, but 16. Okay, we can argue about that. 1956, it's still a lot. Cambodia disarmed its citizens, and between 1975 and 1977, they murdered one million educated people. 1964, Guatemala disarmed its citizens, and between 1964 and 1981, they murdered 100,000 Mayan Indians. 1970, Uganda disarmed its citizens, and between 1971 and 1979, they murdered 300,000 Christians. I mean, um, I also want to say a word to Hispanics and Latinos, so bear with me. I'm just going to say this quickly in Spanish uh, so that it can be shared. Uh, también quiero hablar a los hispanos y latinos. Ustedes saben que tuvimos una guerra de revolución aquí en los Estados Unidos para ganar nuestra libertad. Ustedes conocen bien la corrupción que hay en los gobiernos de sus países como en México, Guatemala, Colombia, lo que sea, donde sea. Todos los gobiernos hoy, incluyendo los Estados Unidos, uh, 
son corruptos y por eso ellos quieren tomar nuestras armas. Y ustedes saben que no pueden defenderse sin armas en contra de un gobierno que tiene todas las armas. Los Estados Unidos están en peligro de caer en una guerra nueva para ganar nuestra libertad de nuevo. Necesitamos unirnos para preservar la constitución como la ley de esta nación. Y también podemos juntarnos y unirnos uh, a liberar la gente en los uh, países por el sur, en México y Americana y, y Latinoamérica. Um, Basically, essentially, what I said is that the Latin and Hispanic people know that we need to have arms to defend ourselves against government corruption. And those people know very well the history and nature of government corruption. <clears throat> and in closing, I simply want to say that I am David Lori Vanderbeek. I am the Constitution Party's candidate for governor of the state of Nevada in 2014. I am prepared to make uh, whatever sacrifice necessary so that we can remain a free people in this state and in this nation. And I hope that you will follow my example and that you will speak out in behalf of the Second Amendment and use your First Amendment right of freedom of speech as aggressively as possible to make it known that you will defend and use your Second Amendment right to defend your Second Amendment right. But we don't want it to come to gun violence or civil war. Um, I'm doing everything I can to prevent that. So I, I wish you the best. I pray for you. I hope that you'll pray for me. Uh, God bless each one of you. Uh, God bless America. I pray for our leaders in our nation, including uh, the, the people that are evil and wicked, that they will see the light, including Obama and people at the TSA and people like Valerie Jarrett and Janet Napolitano. I just want to say a prayer, Heavenly Father. I am so grateful and we are so grateful that we are Americans and that we have a constitution that was given to us by our, our founders and by our fathers and mothers that uh, we have inherited it. Uh, we ask thee to forgive us for not upholding it. We ask thee for, to forgive us for neglecting it. And uh, we pray that if our government, people in our government try to uh, confiscate guns or enforce the NDAA and secretly arrest us and take us away to FEMA camps, we pray that we will be given the strength to uh, eliminate them or remove them from our government uh, and that we will make please you and that we will be able to have the strength to take care of our little ones so that they will not be harmed or slaughtered or molested as we have seen happen in so many historical nations. So uh, we love thee and, uh, and that's my prayer as a Christian man in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.